Good afternoon, and actually, I guess, early evening, and welcome uh, to the uh, yet another container networking uh, session. This one, a panel discussion to kick around a lot of the ideas that uh, we've actually been hearing this afternoon on the container track. Uh, a lot of the interesting perspectives about sort of where we're going. Um, one of the things, or a number of the things that have been touched on in the earlier container sessions we're actually going to dig into in more detail. Uh, but I have with me a distinguished panel uh, to actually comment on a lot of what was going on. I think, um, how many of you were here for the last session? Just a quick show of hands. Ah, excellent. So we're going to build off of uh, a chunk of what was said there and some of the details. You, you've, uh, there has been a lot of discussion about where does networking fit, what are containers doing, uh, where does all of this go next, uh, and sort of what are we looking at. I mean, if we think about what's happening, um, we've moved into an area uh, with containers, with scale, uh, and especially a profusion of projects and capabilities. Um, we were talking about Courier and the last session. Um, you can think about what's happening in a lot of the other uh, automation and integration places, uh, points around orchestration. There's a lot that's taking place, and the scale of containers is starting to do some interesting things to networking. Uh, you put enough containers on a ship, and maybe things start to bend a little bit. But I think what we'll be talking about today is what can we do to work around that. So with that, I'd like to do introductions for our panelists today. Um, so Dan, we start with you, and just a quick introduction, I'll let you guys introduce yourself. Sure. Hi, good evening. I'm uh, Dan Dimitri. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Midokura, and we are a network virtualization overlay company. Uh, I'll keep it short. <laughs> uh, Scott Snedden, I'm with Juniper Networks. Um, I'm kind of an evangelist around SDN and virtualization technologies because the SDN community needs another evangelist, right? <laughs> Come on, the more evangelists, the merrier. Uh, Danian Hansen, I'm a software engineer with Cisco. I've been a technical contributor to several container-related projects within OpenStack over the last year plus. Christopher Lillian Stopi, uh, Director of uh, Solutions Architecture at Metaswitch and the Chief Architect for Project Calico. And Mike Cohen, Director of Product Management at Cisco. I work on uh, Cisco ACI, which is one of Cisco's SDN solutions. Uh, and I, by the way, am Eric Hanselman. I'm Chief Analyst for 451 Research. Uh, and uh, we've been, over the course of a, a series of summits, really looking to address uh, some of the more interesting networking challenges that are cropping up. And in containers, we've certainly got a really interesting one. Uh, the last session was talking about a couple different approaches to tackle some of this complexity. Uh, but I'd like to start with just sort of defining what's the problem? I mean, containers are just awesome and amazing and super and we should be using them and they're great and they do all this stuff by themselves, right? Oh, yeah, good, good, yeah. All right. Well, all right, we're done. Thanks. Hey, it's been real. Uh, so what's wrong? Is this simply a matter of scale? Uh, is this a matter of uh, some of the complexities? I think mean, one of the things we saw in the demo uh, that you know, what we're setting up in containers is a certain amount of abstraction networking, which I think is okay, um, but that has a couple potential issues around it. So thoughts? Is that a good thing, bad thing? Sure. Go ahead. Actually, Christopher and I were talking right before the panel and uh, you know, one of the aspects of containers is that it's a tool that different people use in different ways. A way to package and deploy an application with its dependencies, a much lighter weight version of a virtual machine, uh, all this business about decomposing applications into microservices. It can be very many different things. Um, that said, I'll give you one of my views, which is that uh, application developers that are deploying uh, things in containers in the microservices approach, don't want to care about the low-level details of networking like IP addressing, load balancing, services, et cetera. So I think the challenge there is to integrate with the orchestration systems and infer what kind of networking we should be setting up from it. Uh, there is, of course, also a scale component potentially, but it's a orthogonal issue. Yeah, since I have the mic, I'm gonna chime in on, on top of what Dan said. I think, you know, this is a really, you know, there's a bit of an inflection point going on. It is an interesting point for us to potentially rethink the way we've been exposing networks out of 
cloud management systems and you know, infrastructure as a service, that we no longer need to expose the direct infrastructure as a service. If you're using containers, you're trying to think at a higher level. You're trying to you know, essentially manage an application. And you, you know, we, we actually, it's time to separate out all the operational constraints from how the network works. Am I using VLANs? Am I using VXLANs? What IDs am I using? All the stuff needs to be completely hidden. And really, you know, if you look at kind of what the different comp you know, application composition languages are offering, that's really all the application developer needs to interact with. They should be able to say how pieces of their app fit together, who needs to call what API, and that can be composed into a set of network policies on, you know, on the back end. And you know, whatever system we cook up needs to be able to offer this clear separation of application composition and operational, uh, and, and operational constraints. And I think that's, there's an opportunity to make a big step towards that as this transition happens. So I'll, I'll chime in a bit too. So uh, Calico is doing both uh, OpenStack networking and, and various flavors of container networking. Um, and one of the things we talked to container folks is uh, to echo what's already been said, uh, the developers, the folks who are going to, who are building these container environments don't need Ethernet. They don't need, they don't want to think about VLANs. They don't want to think about constructing networks. They want IP addresses to be reachable uh, for their containers or maybe load balances to be reachable for their containers and that exposes the components of the application and that's it. Um, coming, so I'll spin your question around a bit, the challenge for networking there are many challenges for networking in, in container land, and, and primarily the, the big ones are scale and ephemerality. Those containers come and go very fast, orders of magnitude faster than a VM. There's orders of magnitude more of them than VMs. Uh, so that puts stressors onto uh, any kind of uh, virtual networking infrastructure that's different scale than VMs. The problem for the OpenStack community, I think, is our APIs and the way we think about networks we still, as if you look at, at Neutron, we still make people think in terms of segments and subnets and VLANs and VXLANs and all of this stuff. That's exactly what these container folks don't want. So if we say we're going to do container networking in OpenStack by using Neutron, we're saying we're going to be asking the container folks to use an API construct. That's exactly what they're trying to run away from. And I think that will probably mean that we'll be less successful than we would like. Yeah, I mean, some of the traditional thoughts around segmentation for compliance and all of the things that we have in traditional enterprise networks, Neutron and a lot of the other kind of networking for cloud focus has been, how do I take the old world and adapt it to this new world? And how do I, how do I represent and describe the functions I was doing before in sort of a virtual way? And I think the opportunity is, is, as you guys have been saying, is, is maybe we can rethink that. Maybe you know, we can hide some of that complexity or even, in some cases, possibly ignore some of that complexity and, and simplify the approach. So when you think about that simplification, where does that need to happen? I, mean, I think we've addressed the idea that developers shouldn't need to know about that sort of capability. But yet, if we think about what's out there today, uh, we don't have a lot of abstractions that, that can do that for them. Uh, Dan, you were talking about intuiting uh, what the, the implications of the network ought to be and what those network structures ought to be. Um, how do we wind up doing that? I, tried. I think Mike said something very similar, is that these application description systems, and I've got to be perfectly honest, I'm not familiar enough with this to say something super intelligent. But if you look, I know we've done we've done stuff with, uh, <laughs> yeah, with I know you know we've done we've done stuff with integrating Metonet's deployment with uh, Canonical's Juju, and that it's, itself has been sort of generalizing towards an application deployment infrastructure, which describes dependencies between different tiers, and the IP addresses and the services there they don't matter. You can figure them out. You can assign something random, private, and 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 services in between. So I think that's the kind of thing that at the most basic level we're talking about. Um, yeah, I think there are, you know, if you, in the container world, people are much more running down the road of, of what you might call an intent-based infrastructure, where I signal the intent, which parts need, you know, which of my containers need to talk to which other parts of my containers using, you know, what APIs or what what ports or something along those lines. You know, I need an HTTP connection between this container and this set of containers. 
Um, and we're starting to see some bits of that. Lib Network has made, in, in Docker, for those of you who were here before, has made an attempt at doing that. Um, and it's really just a, a Docker is the only one that's implementing that right now. Uh, the container network interface, which came out of the AppC work that's been going on in the container world, is something that some other folks are starting to standardize around. I wouldn't say they're pure intent, but they're definitely more intenty based than you know, more of an infrastructure based that, that we're more used to in the OpenStack world. So you know, I think all of them, you know, I, I, you know, we've integrated to LibNet. It's got warts. I mean, all of these things have warts on them, but they're further down the right path uh, as to where I think we're ending, going to end up going. No, so honestly, I think the answer is not that complex. You know, there's, there's different label mechanisms that have been emerging in all the different platforms, right? And you know, what you really want is a composable generic grouping construct and labels sort of offer that. You, you know, different containers can get labels. If the labels match up, you end up you know, associating different policies and those policies can trigger different behaviors on the back end. Um, I think this is one of the simpler constructs I've seen. You know, most of the orchestration systems can drive this concept in some ways. And that's really the way, you know, I've seen application developers, you know, something that resonates with them that also is still meaningful to the back-end systems. So that raises the point of where does this stuff actually start to happen? Even if we're doing labeled constructs, if we've got some higher level way of, of intuiting intent, uh, are there projects that are doing that now? And uh, we're sort of hovering on the edge of it. I mean, mention some of what's happening in the AppC world, but uh, what, what's sort of the state of the project environment today um, in an OpenStack perspective about where these things fit and sort of where they need to go? I think within OpenStack, a project that I'm involved in, Magnum, um, that is part of the solution uh, outside of OpenStack. A project that I've been invo involved in in the past um, is OpenShift. So, um, for example, with OpenShift, uh, over the last year plus, it's gone through a refactor based on Kubernetes and Docker, and basically adding to the constructs offered by those systems, um, taking very much a, a developer's approach, right? So understanding that uh, as an application developer, um, the way that I do my work doesn't stop at the Kubernetes level of defining services and pods and so forth. But I have to also think about my source, uh, my source code and how I can um, go ahead and tie my source code to my Docker images, how I can create deployments that encompass uh, maybe environment variables for certain system settings and, and kind of just taking those constructs to the next level. Um, going back to Magnum, um, what Mike said with labels, um, I put together with the help of the community, uh, the container network model uh, for Magnum and we're going through the implementation. And two parts of that was A, to take out the, um, the networking from the core of Magnum, very similar to what Lib Network and Docker did with Lib Network, right? So that we can now um, make networking more pluggable and um, uh, Flannel is, is the first network plugin that's supported. But besides just defining those um, network plugins, each of those network drivers or plugins can have a wealth of configuration information associated with it, specifying subnet sizes and configuration backends and so on and so forth. Um, and we didn't want to bloat the Magnum API by having to add all these different attributes and so forth. And so instead, we took the labels approach. Right, so that you can define what network driver you want to use for your Magnum uh, instantiation of your containerized environment and then pass in um, specific configuration attributes to that particular driver by using labels. And there's actually a bigger initiative within Magnum to, um, to make the system more pluggable across all the different um, software components and add the, the label support across the different software components. So hopefully the network model is just kind of the, uh, the starting point for that effort. So is Magnum enough where it stands today? We talked about the pluggability, the interchangeability of networks. Uh, 
certainly if you take a look at projects like Flannel, that it give you a, a little better way to stitch together container capabilities, sort of build that into the orchestration. Um, what are those pieces that, that need to be added on top of that? And is, is sort of the Magnum model sufficient? So I, I think it's just a starting point now, right? And, and so if you look uh, again, um, you know, Magnum with what we're doing with networking um, is identical to Magnum's overall approach to the project. Magnum's not trying to recreate the wheel, create its own set of tools that competes with Docker, or Kubernetes, uh, but actually embrace those tools, right? And so um, we go back to the, the Magnum container network model. You know, we use LibNetwork as kind of that reference model. Um, and so it's just a starting point. Uh, what we need to be able to do um, just from Magnum's perspective is add more drivers. And, and what we're doing is, is, is you know, looking to the different vendors to get involved in the community and start adding support for things like Calico or Metonet and so forth so that when it comes to networking within Magnum, um, it's, it's a feature-rich service within Magnum. So, um, you know, it, it, the, you know, I take a look at, at the work I'm doing with, with Calico and, and the people I'm out talking with, and there's certainly a subset of the, the user base that I'm talking to that are pure open stack or are pure container model folks. You know, they, they're just going to deploy uh, Mesos or they're just going to deploy Kubernetes or they're just going to deploy open stack. There's a growing consensus among a lot of the user base though that they're going to have a mix. They're going to be running some containers and they're going to be running some open stack. The thing that I'm not hearing from them though is that they want open stack to manage their containers. What I'm not hearing is they want to run containers and VMs under open stack. What I'm hearing is they want to run open stack and in the same physical infrastructure they want to run Mesos or they want to run Kubernetes so they're almost peers. So the real question is, you know, we, the, for the folks who are going to want to run containers within OpenStack, uh, it, it might be an interesting starting point. Uh, but I think there's another use case, which is that there is a common fabric, might be storage and networking and other things, that is shared between uh, OpenStack and something else. Uh, and just to go back to the one question, the comment about tags uh, and labels, and that's the way we're we've cracked in Calico, uh, the policy model and everything else is exactly the same way that everyone else is talking about it. It's, we use labels and policies. And it's, I think that's pretty much anyone who has looked at this and figured out how you're going to do this at scale, how you're going to do this so that five years down the road, you don't have the problem of looking at the firewall and going, okay, well, there's 8,000 rules here in this firewall, and I have no idea which one of these is still relevant or not, but I dare not remove them because I'll break something. You want the policy in your network to be ren transient and rendered just depending on the load that's there. If we're in a container world, that policy may only be relevant for two seconds, and then it may be gone again. There's no reason to put that hard into the network. You, you do this by labels and asserting, rendering the policy as necessary in the network and then removing it when it's done. I like what you said about the uh, about the peer level relationship between OpenStack and other stuff. You know, it, not related to containers, but we've definitely seen that with with uh, VMware and OpenStack in in our deployments. And we what we did actually is we made Neutron the common networking layer, mm -hmm. but but which 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 is great, and I think that we can add Mesos to that and other uh, container things on bare metal, and everything will be. Pretty good, but we're still missing that intent-based, you know, networking model. Right. And is Neutron the right? Right. Well, Neutron is Neutron is containers. Neutron is whatever we make it to be, right? Uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so sure, we could add something to it that that is intent-based, but there hasn't been a whole lot of consensus in the community around that yet. Yet. That is, you know, partially I agree with what Chris said. I've seen a little bit of it where it's you know there's bare metal container environments and, and there's OpenStack and VMs, although I don't think the world is as simple as that and I don't think we can design a solution with that simplifying assumption, right? I think there will be, you know, I've definitely seen customers, they're using VMware as their base environment and they're running 
container systems on top of it. They've always orchestrated infrastructure with VMware, and that's what they're doing. I've seen other environments where they're using OpenStack, and they're running, you know, it's a Magnum model, essentially, um, either directly orchestrated via Magnum or one they've handcrafted themselves. Uh, and I think whatever the, you know, the solutions we build have to be one where we pick points of control that we can actually manage either an over-the-top scenario for containers or a bare metal deployment of containers, and it can't break. Um, you know, you know, and it has to work in a, in a pragmatic, holistic way across these different scenarios that people will deploy. Completely agree. Yeah, and again, going back to the app uh, developer's standpoint, it's yeah. You know, an app developer is going to deploy the containers wherever that app developer can do it quickly and expensively, reliably, and if OpenStack becomes that platform that meets those requirements, then you know we may see a shift um, from your perspective that you're talking about. But you know I I do agree in the sense that um, when it comes to container networking implementations, it's still you know the container world the world is so new that whatever container networking implementation that you're evaluating, uh, one of the evaluation criteria should be, can this container networking implementation work um, outside of an OpenStack uh, cloud? Because it's just still too early, and, and, um, and I, if we were to pause time right now, to your point, you would see more uh, container deployments happening outside of OpenStack than what is happening within OpenStack. Sure, in terms of platforms, but that does bring up the question about bridging the various worlds of networking that we need to link together. Um, Dan, you were talking about Neutron as being a vehicle to be able to do some stitching around that. Um, does that do enough? Do we need to get some level of you know, lower level connection? Are we sort of spitting out VLANs as we get all the way down to the bottom of this? And, and how much of that has to get integrated into the network orchestration piece to work. So. <laughs> okay. Um, I think it doesn't do quite enough. Uh, and again, my example was VMware and OpenStack, so the model is quite the same. It's virtual machines one way or the other, uh, launched by this thing or by that thing. Um, for the, in that sense, Neutron, the Neutron model is nice because it's because VMware ESX, I'm sorry, VMware vSphere doesn't really have a network model per se, so we said, okay, just adopt Neutron, we said to the, to the customer, and that, that seemed to be um, positive, positively accepted. But with containers, it's a bit different, because uh, the framework like Mesos, Mesos is not even a multi-tenant thing, actually, right? I mean, you sort of have to layer something on top of it with a, with a service registry. It doesn't, it's, it's very different. It's a, it's, it's a bit orthogonal in that sense. So we have to come up with something that's uh, more abstract. Maybe the labels are, are the way, but that, that's very confusing for me, to be honest. You know, to to think about applying just the labels only to to neutron networks and policy, and then to the containers as well. So I'm not sure if, yeah, maybe Christopher can enlighten us because I'm I'm getting confused. So um, at least in one implementation, I'm very aware of. It's fairly easy to map security groups into labels and policy, right? So it, it's purely a way of saying I'm attaching this security group to this VM. Well, that's, that can be that security group can be a label can can be represented by a label, and gee, that label can also be rendered in yeah. container land. When you talk about sorry, when you you talk about the integration, I think there's one layer of integration, which is the control plane or the management plane integration, you know, what, whatever we're using to orchestrate these things. The other end, which you're saying down lower, um, how do we interconnect these things? Because Neutron really is just an orchestration shim, right? At the end of the day, the container world, anyway, is pretty much all IP. Um, you know, and uh, I will guarantee you that almost all of the packets coming out of your VMs today are IP. So if you start thinking about what you need to bridge um, these things together, so they all talk to one another, we sort of solved this problem oh, a couple of decades ago. You know, uh, you know, IP sort of won this war. So all of the architectures that we've used to interconnect big disparate networks that all run IP, you know, sort of come into play. You know, you, you can you can route it, you can provision, you can provision IP paths, you can route it, you can use MPLS, there are all sorts of tools. But as long as we sort of keep in mind that at the end of the day, what we're slinging around are IP packets. I, I don't, how many people here are running IPX in their cloud? 
Apple Talk, Banyan Vines. Net, NetBios. Yeah. No, I thought it hurt. Oh, excellent. <laughs> you just shot my idea down. Thank you. Uh, I, I, thought that, I thought there was a hand going up for Vines back there, too. But. Yeah, but I mean, this label discussion kind of is spurring ideas in my mind that I need to go find a whiteboard and think about a bit more. Um, probably not here. Uh, we have them there at the are ready. whiteboards so, there, I see. Well, uh, the wall, but, you know, I mean, it, it would be a relatively straightforward thing to define a way where one of these labels is associated <laughs> with the BGP community, which is associated with some service chain definition that DSDN control, right? So <laughs> back to what you were saying, you know, <laughs> these are problems that have largely been solved at the networking layer, and, and there is probably an abstraction model we can define that, that aligns with, with this model of, of labels for applications that, that could map. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, if, you know, in reality, uh, you know, if you think about one of the ways that the future can go here, you could think about a, a, you know, in some containers of service deployments, a drastically simplified networking model. Um, I've had conversations with folks today about, you know, an all V6 network that was, you know, could built on something like Calico um, that was, you know, a, you know a, a routed V6 network, every container gets an IP. Um, will that work in all environments? It won't, but it's very simple, you know, it's a, it's, it's a relatively simple you know, environment to think about, and it's a relatively simple environment to scale. Um, you know, you know. I think I've worked with different enterprise customers. They require more complex networks, and we can look at other solutions. For, you know, you know, for them. Um, you know, but you know, I think we can start thinking about these kind of simplifying assumptions and what they can do. You know, we can actually design networks around these. You know, these things if we can start co coalescing around them, and we could really simplify the environments we're dealing with. I just came up with the answer to what is the problem with container networking. Networking guys love their abstractions and their, we can do this, this is really cool, you should do it. So there are, you know, not everything is a simple network. But one of the things we need to do as an industry, instead of saying, to your point, you know, instead of saying, here's a really complex construct and I can do all these wonderful things with it. Start off going the other way and say, here's a really simple construct. What can you achieve with this? And you will find some things in some cases where people will need slightly more complex things. But it's the 80, you know, it's the 80% rule. Do you design for the 100% use case? Which is what we've always done in networking and that's why we have RFC stacks that go up to here to, to make MPLS work. Or do you start with something at a very basic level and say, okay, this gets you 80%, and now I'll bolt this on to handle this next 10%, etc. cetera. Our biggest problem is us. We like making things complex, and, and we need to stop doing that because the app developers want to make things complex in their space. They don't need us making things complex for them. We've seen and this the enemy Chris, who's been designing complex networks for how many? Oh, decades, <laughs> decades. Oh, I, I'm not a networking guy. <laughs> no, that's it's a really good point, though, and and um, I mean it's what I've been focused on is what I like about Docker is that uh, philosophy of the batteries included, but but replaceable, and so you know. It, if there's you know a key point you take away from the session is really continue to try to put yourself in the mindset of the application developer. I mean, Docker got big, and the main part was that it took a lot of these complex technologies and and exposed exposed those technologies to a user and made it very easy, right? And so. Uh, if networking comes in and starts to make you know overcomplicate things, then it's never um, it's never going to be consumed by the app developers, and they'll continue to use you know the uh, the native bridge for lib network and deal with it in other ways, right? So speaking of all those things, we've got to wrap around complexity. Um, the previous session sort of skipped merrily over things like address management in a much larger context. Um, is that something that, that we can sort of generally leave behind as we get a little smarter about orchestration? I mean, we've got to exist in a much larger address space. And even V6, you know, we, we can talk about sort of flinging addresses all over the place with, with great abandon. Um, but there's a lot of that service capability that we've got to manage in that larger environment. Um, how do we deal with all that? Ed. The container orchestrators, one thing they do do is manage resources reasonably well. 
IP address is just another resource. You know, so and some things need pinned addresses, but less and less, as people said here, less and less things need pinned addresses. I just need to give you an address. It's ephemeral, and you'll find it via service discovery or whatever else. But you know, I don't think the networking folks. And there are IPAM in a lot of these container uh, networking uh, infrastructures now. Where people are adding IPAM, as, as was stated. But this is, you know, this is just another bit of of another resource that needs to be managed. It, it's nothing, you know, it doesn't need to be anything special. And going back to Lib Network, and I reference Lib Network because uh, I think it's probably the the most well established. Um, you know, networking implementation for Docker containers, and that doesn't say a whole lot in the sense that I don't think it was even around what a, a year ago. It wasn't around uh, right. four months ago. Yeah. <laughs> but um, where I'm going with with this is that um, Lib Network, the, the one of the purposes of Lib Network was to you know extract the networking functionality from Docker uh, Core, Docker Engine, and and Lib Container, and um, and all those core services within Lib Network are being modularized, right? So whatever key value store you want to use, you use libkv, whatever um, IPAM you want to use, that's now um, uh, being pluggable as well. And so, um, you know, I guess the point that I'm trying to make is that if functionality doesn't exist, at least the foundation's there if it's lib network or or most if not all other container related networking projects or lib network uh, plugins um, are doing a good job of making the services pluggable right so again if if there's a service that's not there or a plugin like the ipam plugin doesn't provide the functionality that's needed go through the process like all open source communities to follow that that process of creating the design proposal and then start uh, contributing to it. Looking to the future, uh, we've talked a lot about the developers need to at some point track an IP address, whether or not that comes out of a service directory or what have you. Uh, how do we get to a point at which we move beyond the need to actually grab an IP address, move to namespaces? Is that something that's like way too far out there? Uh, where do we head towards a, a brighter future in which uh, you know that address, you know, the, the, you don't need to know an address uh, to be able to get connectivity? Are we going to named pipes? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if we ever get there. It's it's kind of hard to to tell, but I think. One of the bridges to there is service discovery, and so um, you know, service discovery. If it's not something that um, that you've looked into, spend the time looking into service discovery, um, and that could be part of of the answer. Is is relying less on IP addresses to manages to manage the services that make up your application, and build that service discovery layer so that when you add, remove, or change those application components, they dynamically um, update that, that register. And the other application components now can dynamically communicate with that um, application component. So I used to work in Amazon.com a number of years ago in infrastructure, not AWS. It was just a back-end infrastructure. And in fact, the whole thing was built on a, a service discovery. It was so the so-called service-oriented architecture. There was a whole service registry, uh, service discovery, et cetera. But it was one system that was sort of horizontal across, a, across all of Amazon infrastructure. It was mandated. The problem is that we don't have a standard like that that's not you know, uh, IP or DNS, right? So DNS is service discovery with respect to applications, with respect to Docker. It's it's a it's a kludge, but that's what it is right now. Yeah, I, at Onug last uh, spring, um, Adrian Cockroft gave a talk about using DNS in namespace and what Netflix was doing in that space for exactly solving this. But it's their environment; it's somewhat closed. It's not a standard, and and uh, um, so yeah, I, I think focus on this. Would be good so all thing. we need to do is change DNS, right? Well, maybe. <laughs> Easy, no problem. I, mean, I, I I think some. I'm oh, sorry. You were 
Uh, some of the container folks are already doing this. I mean, you look, you look at Etsy, D infrastructure, et cetera, that it's already a service discovery mechanism in this environment. So I don't think you need to look too far ahead. You know, if you're writing in this new environment, you're already doing that. You actually sort of have to work against the flow to actually go back and try and use real addressing. So I don't think you have to look too far in the future. Anyone who's running something into AWS today, you know, you, you don't worry about your IP addresses too much. So, you know, I, I think we're almost sort of there. Yeah, so the only bit I would add in that, you know, I, I do believe the problem's pretty close to solved with service discovery, as everyone else said. You know, the, the only caveat I would add is, you know, we need to be able to, you know, as you look at different kinds of port remapping techniques and stuff that people can use, it adds a significant amount of backend complexity when something does go wrong. So doing it in a way that actually helps you still manage the network and actually troubleshoot a problem when it occurs, that could probably still be significantly improved. Or just don't remap ports to begin with. Nat, Nat, bad. Nat, especially Pat. Pat, bad. Don't do Pat. Well, so that was that was sort of what I was hitting at a little bit. Like these are, you know, there's some simplifications we can make that, you know, you know what goes beyond, you know, underneath the service discovery mechanisms, which could actually make it easier, easier or hard to, uh, you know, troubleshoot and operate the network and scale it out. Just to add to what Chris was saying with the service discovery, I mean, the technologies are there. You just have to leverage them, right? Um, you know, you still have to um, create your Docker file or your image that is using um, the ability to share that configuration, um, expose um, environment variables so that as you instantiate containers or remove containers, those service components are dynamically added or removed from your service discovery uh, mechanism. So again, technologies are there, but you still have to you know, build your application images to leverage a service discovery layer. All right, well, we're running to the end of our time. Uh, I wanted to hit each of you for uh, one thing you'd like to see in container networking capabilities. We head towards the, uh, the future. Uh, general thoughts about what you'd like to see next. Let's start with just a really simple ask that we keep it abstracted and, and pluggable like you talked about. So, um, you know, I think one of the faults of Neutron in the very beginning, and I said this in Vancouver too, was we tried to build a product instead of building a framework. And, and so let's keep in mind that we want to build frameworks and, and in some cases, some vendor's SDN solution might be the right approach. Maybe some open source project might be the right tool to use, but stop trying to package everything into one shiny little ball and, and uh, keep it a, a pluggable framework. Yeah. So I would probably um, you know, hit on alignment around points of, you know, your, your points of trust and security. Essentially, as we think about containers running in, inside VMs, containers running in bare metal, interacting with you know, true kind of you know, non-containerized bare metal workloads, where are we defining the different points of trust and the points of enforcement of different you know, security policies, whether they're labels or, you know, or however they're defined? Um, you know, actually have a community you know, align on you know, w you know, what software tools are we using to enforce this? Is it open vSwitch? Is it tool, you know, tools on top of this? How can we do it in a unified manner so that we can actually give a unified security model across all these different deployment mechanisms? I'm going to focus on something related to what Chris said, visibility. So with so many different containers moving around, being ephemeral, uh, not moving around necessarily, but being you know being very ephemeral and, and changing and not necessarily having their addresses be uh, important. They're all, they're all automatically assigned and such. Figuring out what has actually happened, you know, after the fact, means that we need some sort of capability to record and pour through a bunch of data potentially when things go wrong. So uh, I think uh, mine's sort of in two parts. One, keep in mind that what we're interested in is what people are actually trying to do, not the underlying infrastructures. So don't go down that slippery slope of, oh, I can just create a subnet data model. And that pops into the second half. A fairly standardized 
data model or approach to a data model that, that has in concept you know, labels or some other kind of intent-based uh, infrastructure that pretty much everyone agrees on. It doesn't have to be exactly the same, but it's much easier if we have a common data model or metadata model that would make it easier to then integrate into things like an open stack on one side and a Mesos and, and something else. If we all have our own data models because mine's 5% better than yours, uh, it just makes things more difficult and there's more abstractions. More abstractions make it more difficult to troubleshoot, etc. cetera. Uh, well, I think one is gonna be, it's gonna be a tough, um, uh, I would say simplification is, is high. I mean, when we start thinking about containers inside VMs, inside cloud networking, inside physical networking, okay, great, I got it up and running and it's deployed. What happens when things break, right? Is it the uh, container network overlay? Is it the cloud network? Or, you know, so simplifying um, container networking, I think, is very important. Uh, standards, I'd like to see more standards be developed around container networking. Um, you know, I was really happy to see uh, OCI or the Open Container Initiative and actually it being stemmed from Lib Container. Uh, I'd like to see something similar, f um, maybe if it's Lib Network or some other software library that becomes the standard for container networking. Um, last but not least, I'd like to see better integration. And this kind of goes back to, you know, labels. I think uh, labels is part of it, but just better integration with um, application uh, development or application platforms. I gave some examples of OpenShift, but if it's Cloud Foundry or whatever it may be, um, right now you could do a lot of really cool things for, um, with these application platforms. But when it comes to a networking standpoint, there's not a whole lot you can do there. Uh, I would really like to see that you can specify policy, um, that you can specify all sorts of different characteristics and expose those potentially through labels to that application platform. All sorts of characteristics, including potentially NetBio support. So. All right. Well, with that, uh, why don't you join me in thanking our panelists this evening. Uh, we're standing between you and Beer. So, uh, We'll talk to you down at having a beer. So thanks very much, everybody.